Hi. If this stops working, I don't know that I will know that. So if it stops working, just wave at me, please. Right now I am shaking like a leaf because of technology, not because of teachers. This I'm accustomed to, this I am not. And Duncan already did the Madonna joke. <laughs> he stole all his jokes this morning. Um, do you have a good lunch? Yeah? If your digestion kicks in, please do not fall asleep. Not yet. All right? And not after my session either, because after my session, we have the special prize moment. Okay? We are keeping you in the room until then. And if you want a prize, you have to stay in the room. Ha ha. All right? Um, as Duncan said earlier, Duncan just about killed this for me earlier by telling me that he had had that conversation with the teacher who wanted to sit and listen and not do any activities. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> To keep you awake after lunch, I'm going to ask you to do things. You're going to be chatting to your neighbours. So check that you are sitting with people that you like. Because you're going to have to talk to them. And your students usually sit next to people that they like. All right? Um, the title of the session is quite long, so I've shortened it for you. It's just called What the Eyes See. Um, the excuse for the session is critical thinking and how to bring in global issues, isms, into the classroom. But all the stuff we're doing is actually more connected to how the brain works and how your brain works in connection with your eyes. All right, my sort of recent, the last few years, some of you have actually been on training courses with me before. I know some faces. Um, the last few years, my sort of specialization is the teenage brain, the adolescent brain, and how it works, and which bits of it work, and which bits of it don't work very well, etc. So my teaching activities, and some of them are in here, are all adapted to the adolescent brain. Uh, for reasons of time, I'm not going to go into the great big picture of it, but you will have my email is on the first slide and the last slide. And I didn't bring any business cards. But you all have a telephone in your pocket, don't you? So you can all make your own little cards. All right, it's on the last slide as well. So you can just email me and say, can I have the Belgrade slides, please? And I'm going to do what Duncan did. Where is he? Back there. Um, if you do have any questions at any point, write them down, and I'll get Duncan to run around and collect them from you. <laughs> and then he can come back up and stage and give them to me. Um, and we'll do that towards the end of the session. Okay? And before I get into the main part, another very quick question. Some parts of this morning I found the sound a little difficult. Are you hearing me okay now? Yes. Clearly? Yes. Right, there's no strange echo. No? This is going to be like pantomime. Have you ever been to a pantomime? Pantomime in Britain is a traditional Christmas theatrical experience where the audience shouts at the actors. And when the body comes on stage, in fact, the body always comes from that side, and when the body comes on stage, the audience shouts, look behind you, okay? If you see me walking towards that piece of tape, that plug, or under there, <laughs> shout, look out, all right? Because otherwise, I will cause a shadow, and with this, you will get that horrible wang noise, okay? So just shout at me. So we're going to be talking about how the eyes work, and I'm hoping to show you some things that intuitively you know, but you don't yet know that you know. And hopefully at the end, you will know what you know now. Okay?
We'll start with an activity. Groups. For practical reasons, I am not going to put you into groups. You can put yourselves into groups. Okay? So look around you. Choose about three or four nice-looking people. People who are friends or you would like to have them as friends. Um, and you're going to see some pictures. We're going to look at these pictures. And the first thing we're going to do is... Think of a, a, an adjective of personality or character for each of those. If you are parents, do not do this with your children. We do not encourage judging people by their appearance as parents. However, as teachers, anything goes. Look at the pictures and think of personality adjectives. All right, I will give you about, how many seconds, Duncan? Was it 34? 35 and a half seconds. Small groups, okay? Group yourselves up to five or six. Have a look. One personality adjective for each of those people, please. Okay? Now we're going to try something that uh, is easier to do in a normal sized classroom. I'm going to ask you to shout at me so that I can hear where your suggestions are. Okay? Um, what about the green lady, the lady with the green border? What adjectives have you got for her? Shy. Pardon? Reserved. Kind. So we've got shy, reserved, kind. One more? Pardon? Good-hearted and self-confident. Okay, I like all those. So this is her personality now. What about the lady with the yellow round? Friendly. Outgoing. Generous. Cheerful. Open. People at the back, you put your hand like this and shout, all right? Okay, so we've got, she's outgoing, she's kind, she's friendly, etc. Somebody said open. Top right, the red. It's supposed to be red. It's dulled down a bit by the projector, but it's red. Pardon? Sporty. Confused. Sporty, but confused. He's running the wrong way. Outgoing, energetic, hardworking, competitive but confused. <laughs> no idea who his rivals are, but he's going to compete anyway. <laughs> right. Bottom, this one, bottom left, pale blue. Shout louder. <laughs> Pass that one forward, what was that? Oh, manipulative. Oh, okay. Aggressive, manipulative and aggressive. And hardworking. So he's manipulative, aggressive, but hardworking. Oh, stubborn, sorry. It's my hearing is more affected by this than I thought. Sorry. Stubborn, so he's manipulative, aggressive and stubborn. Sounds like my ex. Middle, at the bottom. Diligent, intelligent. Shy. Curious. There's obviously a boy-girl bias here, isn't there? And bottom right, the blue. Artistic, eccentric. Cheeky, adventurous. Creative, etc. Now, in your groups, you've just created these personalities. We've got our reserved, kind lady. We've got our outgoing, cheerful one. We've got our confused, competitive athlete. Um, we've got my ex. We've got curious, intelligent, etc., etc. And we've got Mr. Cheeky, creative, eccentric, 
chap. Now in your groups, you're going to do professions. That's the lesson that we're working towards is the one that talks about daily routines and professions. You know, he works outdoors, he wears a uniform, he works from nine to five, all that kind of stuff. He doesn't work. Um, he manipulates. He gets other people to work, etc. Um, so in your groups now, Look at those pictures and think, what profession might each of those people have in your small groups? Okay? How are you doing? Are you using the cheat sheet or not? <laughs> I have the power. Who else? It's not only the guy whose bottom left is manipulative, is it? Hee <laughs> hee. <laughs> Ta da! Right. What do you think? Our kind, reserved, friendly lady. Nurse. Doctor. Could be midwife, somebody. Teacher. Okay. Social worker. If she's shy and reserved, that's more of an anti-social worker, but yeah. The yellow one. Teacher, lawyer, doctor, social worker. Because she's friendly, this one, so she's a social worker. Okay, our confused athlete. A firefighter. For the system. Yep. Musician. Football player, basketball player, Mr. Manipulative, Pardon? businessman, politician, police officer, manipulative, stubborn and aggressive, okay. <laughs> Not a British bobby then, hey? Uh, bottom middle, pink. Housewife. You're going to regret that one. Housewife. Pardon? Scientist. Teacher. There's a lot of teachers up here, aren't there? And bottom right now, creative, eccentric. DJ. What's he? A YouTuber. A YouTuber. I guess. <laughs> He looks about 30 years too old to me to be that, but anyway. Okay, so we've got our profession. So, so far, we've looked at these pictures. I have used a uh, word to blank out word or paint. I forget which one I use. Paint, possibly, but part of the normal office suite. Just to blank out any contextual clues, but also to use color instead of A, B, C, D, E, F, or 1 to 6. All right, and the color we'll come back to in a minute. You have brainstormed adjectives, so you've got the vocabulary going. You've then thought, okay, those personality adjectives, these professions. Some of you will have used the cheat sheet, and some of you didn't, and that happens with students as well. Students who are less self-confident 
will tend to use that. And students are a bit more, you know, will be going, nah, it's none of those. It's a scientist and a teacher and a, etc., and a politician. Um, I also just took a basic matching exercise from my course book that has picture, a bunch of words, and says match. And my teenagers have gone, oh, yeah. End of. Maybe looked at a neighbor. And then they go, nah. I'll wait till the teacher gives us the answers. So I've just made this into something a bit more, a bit sassier. This is the sexy matching exercise. Okay, and it doesn't take that much preparation. It's a little bit of scanning, a little bit of paint, plus I use it a lot. All right, so I've got my pictures. Whoops. Now, I took these pictures from, guess where, the internet. They are real people. They're not actors. They're not course but actors. They are real people. And in the original photo, they are real people in their professional capacity. So I'm going to show you the real photos. Are you ready to go and regret the comment about the housewife? I'm also, when I show you, I'm just going to let you chat for a couple of seconds, you know, 10 seconds, 15 to 34 or whatever it was, seconds. Um, because that's what I do with my students. I want the kind of the whole stereotypey, let's smash the stereotypes thing. I want them to do that because I do not want to give them my opinions. They are intelligent creatures, most of them. Okay? And in her spare time, she's a housewife. Um, anesthetist, deliberately chosen because it's a heck of a word to spell. Um, when I do this activity, the kids are busy trying to memorize the word, but they're also trying to memorize the shape of the word because I have not said the word. So they're not kind of trying to store the sound of it. So we're going straight to spelling, basically. That's why I put anesthetist in for you. Okay, I can say it. It's taken years of practice. <laughs> um, obviously, I deliberately looked for photos that do break the stereotypes. Any surprises? Put your hand up if you were not surprised. Good, right. <laughs> this is it, you see? And I, didn't, I don't need to then have the big discussion about gender roles and whatever. If the discussion comes from the students, we have it. But just introducing, it's, it's the whole thing about you know, diversity and inclusion. Just bring the thing into the classroom. Have the discussion if they want to have it. But just bring these people into the room, okay? Um, it's easy to criticize course books. I write course books. Some of you actually probably use some of my course books. Um, the people who look for the photos for course books are limited to specific banks of photos. Having had to do this job myself this last summer, I have discovered how incredibly difficult it is to find legally available photos of male secretaries or um, female doctors, weirdly enough, or a picture of any female secretary that doesn't have a miniskirt up here. And, you know, it's actually incredibly difficult. You laugh. It's actually not funny. Try it. Go into one of these photo resources like Shutterstock and put the word secretary or schoolgirl and be prepared. Um, so as a teacher, I make the effort because... As a course book, I know the limitations on that side of things. As a teacher, though, I know how to overcome them, okay? It's the two sides of my split personality. Um, 
An activity like that, though, it ticks a lot of theory boxes as well. Um, it makes students feel safe because the, the sort of the, the weaker, the so-called weaker students, or the students who feel they are weaker. Uh, I think it was Duncan earlier. The thing about you know the self-doubt and the fear. Well, they can look at that cheat sheet, and that will help them feel safer. Working in groups, they will feel safer. You know, I said to you, I didn't say you tell me what you think. All right. So it's all engineered to make them feel safe. Um, give them control. Not so much at this stage, but in the next stage, when we're moving towards the routines, they choose one of those ones to write about. They've got six choices there. It's not just now let's talk about the daily routines of a firefighter. No, it's choose one of those and maybe research it. Find out what is the daily routine of an anesthetist. Hmm? Um, pride, self-esteem, it's a game. They can win. They can get it right. Usually what happens in the, you know, when I reveal the pictures, somebody goes, yeah, I knew it was a pilot. That sort of feeling of yes. And you need yes moments in your lessons. You need them because the yes moments make the brain function differently. And it helps the brain form memories. Okay, that comes down to the bottom one. Sociocultural theory, that's a Vygotsky thing, and I do love a bit of Vygotsky in my sessions. Um, Lev Vygotsky had this theory, and it is becoming acknowledged through uh, neuroscience. It, it's, it's pretty much there. He came up with it intuitively. We learn best in the learning of environment that we are accustomed to the learning environment in which we learnt our first stuff, you know, when we were little. When I was little, I spent a lot of time, I'm from Scotland, okay? The weather in Scotland, you've probably heard of it. So I spent a lot of time indoors, and I spent a lot of time with grandparents and aunts and uncles, sitting on knees with storybooks. So for me, stories, that's the best way for me to learn. I can explain grammar to you by telling you a story about how the grammar happened. You know, where did the ER ending come from? If I tell it as a story, certainly I learn it better. History, I don't know if you like history. I'm dreadful in history lessons, but I can read a historical novel. And the story will stick. That is my learning environment. That's the sort of socio-cultural theory applied to me. Current generation, a lot of their initial information is coming at them from images and screens. They are comfortable in that environment. We grown-ups sometimes make a thing about technology and, oh, do we use technology or not? That's a bit like saying, do we use pens and paper or not? When you were at school, did you have to write with a feather? Did you write with a quill or did you write with a pen? Put your hand up if you wrote with a quill. <laughs> pen, yeah? Do you think there were conferences then about do we use pens or should we stick to feathers? Right, so the current learning environment suggests we should use technology, but also we should use screens and we should use images because that is the way our kids are learning a lot of their stuff. Video, pictures, all right? It's the Instagram generation. So that's sociocultural theory, and the activity before connects with it, and so do all the others in this session. And then the brain, this is sort of my current area, area of um, investigation and research. Caudate, caudate nucleus, the amygdala, and the hippocampus, that's three parts of the brain. You can Google them later. I am not going to talk a lot about them now. But they are triggered by things like beauty i.e. pictures, music, etc. Uh, they are triggered by activating those senses. So again, pictures, uh, colors, um, anything sort of attractive and eye-catching. Uh, attention, we attract attention by, through the senses. So again, sound. Uh, Duncan earlier doing this, the sort of the movement and the weird image attracts the attention. You're going, what is he doing now? If I make a funny noise, which I'll try not to, we all go, well, something happened. There was some noise, a conversation or something, or a phone, or I don't know what, pinged, and everybody went, what? All right, so we can use the senses to attract attention and to form memories, because those three parts of the brain work together to create 
memory, long-term memory. Okay? So if we activate them, if we trigger them, and if we make them work, we are fixing the information in the memory. And we're fixing it more efficiently. The hippocampus is the part of your brain. It's above the other two bits. Chordate nucleus is at the bottom. Then there's the amygdala kind of here. Hippocampus is over the top. If you imagine inside a cauliflower, it's where the stem meets the, the other bit. That's where the hippocampus is. It sits there, and it works through mapping things. It remembers where things are. When you lose your keys, put your hand up if you have never lost your keys. Never. Your hippocampus is overactive. Relax. <laughs> But when we lose our keys, most of us go, hang on, where did I last have them? And you go through that thing of, I had it there, do, 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 and you do a mental map, don't you? Yeah? And have you ever done that thing, particularly when you're a tired student at university, say, and you're going, oh, I remember where it is on the page, but I don't remember what it says. That's your hippocampus is tired. Exactly, you see? Um, the color that I used around the pictures, they reinforce the hippocampus. I am triggering the hippocampus through the color, and it will fix a little map. Even now, when you picture those faces, you can picture the blues, can't you? You can visualize the green, you can visualize the yellow, can't you? Yeah? Yeah? And that will help fix those pictures. And then through the associations that we made with the game and the reward, the sense of, yes, we're forming memory. Okay? And we can use all this knowledge in the classroom. But that's the theoretical stuff. As a teacher, whoop, font has moved. As a teacher, the theory, yeah, okay, but I'm not going to read that every day, neither are you. But these three things are what I want as a teacher. I want my students to feel safe in my classroom. I'm not going to tease them. I'm not going to humiliate them. I'm not going to say, you said housewife. And I'm not pointing at the person who said it. Um, I want them to feel engaged with the material because if they're engaged with it, I know their amygdala is working. If their amygdala is working, I know they're learning. I know their memories are forming. Right? But I need them to be engaged because indifference is the enemy. Kill indifference. Okay? Um, and of course, I want them to learn something. I'm a teacher. I'm obsessive about it. Aren't you? And learning something doesn't have to always be a new piece of language because sometimes we just need to repeat and review and recycle. Um, I think it was Lorena mentioned repetition. Yeah, repetition, and not just several times. We know that each piece of information, each piece of vocabulary, for example, has to be encountered between 15 and 30 times for it to stick. If it's a word that you like, like in Catalan, the word for meatballs is mandungillas which I love as a word. I don't eat meat, but it doesn't matter. I love the word, so I remember it. That kind of word you remember faster. Words that you need a lot. Pivo. No? And fala, and various molim, and these words. Words that we need, we remember. Uh, the words we don't use so much, it's 30 times. Okay? So... Learning something can be something that isn't the language because I'm practicing the language. Make sense? Yeah? So I'm going to try, hopefully, and teach you something new now. I hope it's new. Um, can you organize yourselves into pairs? All right? Just into pairs. If you're a three, it doesn't matter. But if you're in a three... Two of you will be A and one of you will be B, or two of you will be B and one of you will be A. But roughly into pairs, can you decide now which person in your pair is A and which person is B, please?
Okay? That was not the most complex thing we're going to do this afternoon. Right, you ready? I am going to show the A's a photo. The A's are going to see the photo for three seconds. All right? Three seconds means as long as it takes me to count to three in my head. So you get to see it for three seconds, and then I'll take it away. And then B will see a picture for three seconds, and I will take it away. All right? So the first thing to do is, B's, please close your eyes. A's, please check by any means you wish that the bees have their eyes closed. Okay? Are you ready? A's, bees, keep your eyes closed, or A, just go on the back of the head. It's only three seconds, so look carefully and remember as much as you can because you're going to have to describe it afterwards. You ready? Oh, you're going to miss him when he's gone. <laughs> now, Ace, could you close your eyes, please? Bees, get your revenge. Check the A's have their eyes closed. Okay, B's, this is your photo. You ready? Remember, look carefully. You're going to have to describe it in a moment. Okay. Could you actually see it over there? Roughly. All right. Sorry, you've got this thing in the way. Ah. You might want to move in a minute. <laughs> right, in your pairs, describe your pictures to each other, please. In as much detail as possible. In a semi-organized fashion, we're going to try and describe these pictures together. You only had three seconds. Or four, or four and a half-ish. So, shout out. Now, you may hear each other better than I can hear you with this thing over my ears. But anyway, what was on the first photo? A's. Trump. Apart from a Trump. People. People taking photos. Is that all we saw? Trump and some people taking photos? A young man. <laughs> okay. We're going for the stuff we look at first, isn't it? Quite informal. Okay, so we've got Trump. We've got people taking photos. We've got a young man. We've got informally dressed. Right, so there's doors, yeah? Two doors or something. Mm -hmm. There's no man in there. They're all outside. Anything else? Okay, we'll check all this in a moment. All right. The second photo, bees, what did you see? People having their photo taken, having their picture taken? Yeah? 15 of them. A girl in an orange dress, maybe a red dress. Men in black suits. Red hair, somebody with red hair. Pardon? Okay, okay, right, yes. <laughs> All right. Now, excuse me, excuse my back. Um, three seconds, why? Because there's this thing called Snapchat, and there's this thing called Instagram, and there's, we live in, and on WhatsApp, and we live in the... Phew, phew, age, don't we? We live in the age of lots and lots of photos, images, but how long do we look at them for? I firmly believe that we need to train teenagers in particular to look carefully at pictures and learn how to read pictures. I don't like the term visual literacy 
I don't think it's new. Have a look at all those paintings of saints from before people could handwrite and read. You know, visual literacy has been around us for centuries, if not millennia. Um, but now we need specific skills to read pictures more slowly because we look at them quickly. If you look at this photo, your eyes are immediately drawn to the Trump. But actually, Melanie is in it. This is Melanie in the white trousers. Melania, sorry, not Melanie. She's so obvious, I'd forgotten her name. Um, Melania is in it. People are taking photos. But if you look carefully, you will notice that really, um, we're taking photos of the group that isn't Trump. If you look at that photo carefully, the group on the right are actually all together, like one big happy family, to have their photo taken. And the Trump has separated off. I apologize if anybody in this room is a Trump fan. <clears throat> I'm not. He's not actually the main focus. The main focus is the other side. The main story is going on on the right, but the photographer knows how our eyes work. And the photographer knows that in this room, I don't think anybody, are any of you Arabic speakers by, you know, first language? No. Chinese? No. Okay. So we all, our first language that we learnt to read in, we learnt to read from left to right. And we read photos the same way. And we form our conclusions about the pictures that we look at from left to right. So what we see there in this quick three-second glance is a photo of Donald Trump having his picture taken. And actually it's not. It's the governor of Puerto Rico. It's Melania. It's the mayoress of San Juan, or wherever it was. And they're the ones having their picture taken. Um, and in this picture, what we miss is that, yes, it's people having their photo taken. And yes, there's somebody in an orange dress and there's people in suits. But what do all those people have in common? Apart from smiles, they're all together. They have something else I'm not sure how well you'll see this. If you're nearer the front, you might get it. They are all transgender. Ooh. <laughs> and if you look at that for three seconds, and if you look at it from a distance with a whole stage in the middle, it's not so clear. But if you look at it carefully and you look at it slowly, you start to go, oh, hang on a minute, all the men are short and there's some very tall ladies and etc., etc., etc. They're all transgender. Now, as a teenager teacher or a teacher of teens, and nowadays, as I've moved back to Britain, I lived in Spain for 28 years, um, now I live in Britain and I'm not actually teaching English as a foreign language, but I am teaching public speaking and I teach to groups of about 50 or 60 teenagers in state schools. Um, and it's, you know, so I'm still teaching them this stuff. I'm saying, you know, if you want arguments for your debates and your public speaking, look at the stuff that you're being fed through social media. Look at it carefully. But also I'm aware of the fact that some of my students are at that age where they're beginning to think, hmm, about their own identity, some of them. But they're not comfortable with sharing it, necessarily. And they're not seeing themselves represented or reflected really anywhere around them in the school. You know, they're obviously not in course books because course books are sold in certain kinds of markets, etc. So I bring this kind of image into the classroom, not to discuss, not to debate, just to bring it in. As I said before, I don't force the discussion. If they want to have the discussion, they have the discussion. If they don't, they don't. But at least I am bringing, shall we say, alternative realities into my classroom, okay? 
All right? So have a look at some of these photos that you see around you in social media. Pick out a couple. Try reading them from left to right. Try flipping them. And have a look at the truth. And use those in your lessons, I suggest. More. More? Cameron, what's next? Yes, I can. To follow up on the thing about reading from left to right, um, and to show you one that it is something that photographers know and has been used for a long time, and two, that you can actually get some interesting discussions and stuff from it, I've pulled together a series of photos from sort of history of the news of the last, I don't know, 40, 50 years. Um, I'm going to flip through them. I think there's about five of them. Just have a look. Have a look at each one. And then in your small groups, just have a quick discussion. What do they have in common? All right? And with my classes, I extend this on into big debates and, you know, write about it. And we have discussion, proper discussion. For the sake of now, you're going to have about three minutes. All right? So you're just going to have a look at the pictures. I'll take them quite slowly. You don't have to memorize. Just look at them. And then in your small groups, what do they have in common? What similarity in the stories do they tell? All right? Can you actually see properly from down there? Cool. Okay, I can't remove this. So. There's the first one. Let's have a look and a think. I'll ping them back and forth. Second one. This one's slightly different. Similar but different. Okay? All right, just in your small groups or pairs, just have a little chat. What, do those, what stories are they telling? What do the stories have in common? Okay? We're not going to have a big discussion, but we can have a mini one. Do you see anything in common between those photos? Yeah, you've got individual on which side? Right, on the right hand side, the word right. Hey, hey, hey. Um, on the right, we have the individual who is right. Usually a woman, apart from that one. Okay, we've got a, a peace and aggression. In this case, it's not quite that, but it's similar. In that we only know what the aggressive thing is because of that person. What is that person's profession? He's a firefighter, therefore we know the aggression is from a fire. All right, it's not him, but it, he's the indication that it's a fire. It's actually from Grenfell, that. Um, what else? So we've got aggression and resistance or whatever. We've got the individual and the group. Uniforms. Exactly, we've got uniforms and sort of militia and arms and all that stuff on one side and flower and ribbons and whatever. Yeah? 
Victims, exactly. We've got this idea of victims. But victi exactly, victims who shouldn't be victims, this sort of, etc. and the forces. Exactly, resistance to pressure. And so the last one is slightly different. I just wanted to show you that uh, it's not the, quite the same story, but it still kind of feeds into our subconscious narrative. We see these images all the time. They're consistently winning prizes for best photo of the year, all that kind of stuff. But it does feed into this narrative of aggression and, um, and sort of passive, not passive, but victimness. Um, you can use that as a discussion. You can also use it to have a discussion about why is it always men that are in the I role? You know, poor boys. There's a lot of ladies in this room. We ought to start representing some of these guys as well. <laughs> yeah. Men are not always the baddies. Um, but it's worth, you know, instead of just showing one image, show several and teach them to read that it is this way. And I'll show you a curious thing that I found in my son's school. Can you see that? This is in my son's school, all right? It's when you go in, in the reception area. And it's about asthma. Top left is in English. He's got an inhaler. And the inhaler is this side. And he's here. So we know that he's going, and not, because if he was going, the image would be that way. Because we read from left to right. However, my son goes to multilingual school, a multicultural school. So the languages that are read the other way around, the picture has been flipped. Can you see that? Okay, QED, as they say. So this sort of narrative of um, before and after, domination and whatever, is consistent in our images. You just flip them for different languages. There's a, I heard a story about a detergent company, clothes detergent, who found that their publicity was not working in, I think it was Japan, Korea. Anyway, it was somewhere where the writing is that way. And it was because in their publicity, they had, and I tried to draw this earlier, um, they had the washing... Let me have a think this way around. So the washing was on that side, and the person was on this side to suggest that the washing was done. But if they didn't flip the image, it looked like the washing had still to be done. All right, because it was being read the other way around. Draw it yourself later, and you'll see what I mean. I sat earlier trying to draw it. Um, but it's used in advertising. Phot photographers use it. Therefore, my point being, you can use these images in class. You can teach your students to read them and just ha use them as discussion. What is the narrative? And then you will help them read images in their, uh, in their normal life, shall we say. Okay, so... Colour is also used in the image with Trump and in the image with the transgender people. Oh, orange dress. Oh, lady in a yellow jacket. Colour also draws our attention. Colour helps the hippocampus for memory. So we can use that knowledge as well when we're preparing materials. Try this. I'm going to ask you to look at that picture. You're going to memorise it. Then I'm going to take it away and in your small groups are going to try and describe the differences, express the differences between those girls. All right? So have a look at the pictures and just memorize them. How long do you need? Say a number. Five. You've got five seconds. <laughs> All right? Now I'm using the fact that memory should reinforce, uh, color rather, should reinforce your memory. Okay, ready? In your small groups now, describe those girls, compare them, explain the differences, but you may not use any color related words. Okay? Try and describe that picture to each other. Get as much information as possible, but you may not use any color words.
Can you do it? How's it going? Now, see, as a teacher with a lot of knowledge about the brain and the eyes, you see, I do it this way because I know that in my classroom I can use colour to fix things in the memory. So I use colour pictures and I use quite strong colour pictures for memory games where I want to get vocabulary like hair or dress, tall or shorter, all that kind of stuff. This is essentially a vocabulary activity. However, I also know that. What does that mean? These are things to think about. 12, two X's, and 200. What do they refer to? They're the reason I said don't use color words. No? Because one in 12 male people are colorblind. One in 12. How many boys do you teach? If you teach in a school and you're, if you're in a boys' school and you've got, say, 30 something kids in your class, statistically speaking, you've got at least three colorblind guys in there. And they probably won't tell you because if they tell you, they become different. All right? So unless they're completely comfortable with all other 34 people in the room, and let's face it, that's never the case, they'll be keeping it quiet. So bear it in mind, one in 12 boys is colorblind. So what does 200 mean? Yeah, one in 200 female people are colorblind. So women, female, I say female people because... It's genetically female and genetically male, okay? Um, it's one in 200 women and one in uh, 12 men because the capacity to perceive color is in the X chromosome. And girls, we got two. So we have double the chance of being able to see colors. And that's also the reason why women, we talk about teal and turquoise and duck egg blue. And the guys go, what? And that's blue, isn't it? Or green. Because we do actually see color slightly differently. Okay? So when you're preparing those funky color pictures for memory activities, do remember that when it comes to the talk to your partner bit, some of your students are going to go, oh, no. don't mention the green one because I don't know where the green one is. Okay, and I've had this in class with blue and grey, so it's not always red and green. Um, so then when you do the feedbacky thing, take away the colour. Just scan your picture, stick it in Word, click on colour correction, take out the colour. And then look at it in black and white. Okay, and that way you even the field. Now, right, that's just a little recommendation for you. I've got a couple of minutes more. I hope nobody minds if I take five more minutes because we started a little late. Um, so that's color blindness. Um, using pictures for stories, this is just another bit of science though. For memory games and that kind of thing, memory activities and vocabulary and whatever, color is great. However, color saturates the imagination. So for storytelling things, look at the picture and tell the story sort of stuff. Don't use colour. Look at this picture. It's very brightly coloured. It's taken by Ian James and it's to be found in ELT pics. But it's useless for a story activity because the story is happening in the only part of the picture that isn't very colourful. It's happening around here. And this part of the picture is kind of shades of sepia, which if you're a boy means yellow brown, okay? That is where the story is, and all the bright color detracts from it. So when you're preparing pictures for stories, take out the color. All right, and for my former soul trainees, that's Baggy Point near Croyd Bay. All right, you've been there.
Um, take, out the, take out the color, all right, when you're using pictures for imagination. And get your students to activate the amygdala and activate the senses just by then saying, okay, what can she see? What can she hear? What can she smell? How does she feel? And get them to access their senses. Don't give them all those colors. Let them imagine the colors. All right? And also by taking away the color, you take away some of the clues and they have to use their imagination. And you'll get better stories. But access it also through the senses, okay? Activate the senses, because then you're activating the amygdala and the caudate nucleus, which are two of the three parts that form memory, okay? Teeny bit of time left. That was just to say... It doesn't have to be black and white. It can also be not a great variety of color. Those kind of pictures work as well for stories. I'm not going to explain this one because you're going to email me. And I always do this in my sessions. I always include, uh, if you want to know it, you've got to email me. Activity. So if you do email me, I'll explain this one then. Last thing, very, very last thing though, hopefully will work. And it's a video, and it will take us about three minutes, and then it will be time for prizes. Which is why you're here, isn't it? Um, that's why I'm here, hey. I get to pronounce your names in Serbian. <laughs> um, this is exactly what I do with my students, okay? You may have seen this video before, but with my students I say, we're going to watch a video, and you're going to tell me what activity we do with it. You're going to work in groups, you're going to watch the activity, uh, watch the activity, you're going to watch the video, and you're going to say, Fiona, can we do, uh, or can we do, uh, all right? And you can choose what you want, you decide in groups, all right? So you're going to do the same. You're going to watch the video, when it's finished, I'm going to run around the room like crazy. <laughs> no, I'm not. But you're just going to tell me a couple of ideas, and then if you want questions, we'll have like 30 seconds for questions, okay? You ready to see it? I do hope it works. Where's my IT chap? He's run away. Hi, Erin. Hi. Okay, so I'm going to just give you some actions to do. I just do the first thing that comes to mind. Show me what it looks like to run like a girl. Oh, my hair. Oh, my God. Show me what it looks like to fight like a girl. <laughs> now throw like a girl. Aw. My name is Dakota and I'm 10 years old. Show me what it looks like to run like a girl. Throw like a girl. Fight like a girl. What does it mean to you when I say run like a girl? It means run fast as you can. So do you think you just insulted your sister? No. I mean, yeah, insulted girls, but not my sister. Is like a girl a good thing? I actually don't know what it really, if it's a bad thing or a good thing. It sounds like a bad thing. It sounds like you're trying to humiliate someone. So when they're in that vulnerable time, between 10 and 12, how do you think it affects them when somebody uses like a girl as an insult? I think it definitely drops their self-confidence and um, really puts them down because during that time, they're already trying to figure themselves out. And when somebody says, you hit like a girl, it's like, well, what does that mean? Because they think they're a strong person. It's kind of like telling them that they're weak and they're not as good as them. And what advice do you have to young girls who are told they run like a girl, kick like a girl, hit like a girl, swing like a girl? Keep doing it, because it's working. If somebody else says that running like a girl, or kicking like a girl, or shooting like a girl is something that you shouldn't be doing, that's their problem. Because if you're still scoring, and you're still getting to the ball on time, and you're still being first, if you're doing it right, it doesn't matter what they say. I mean. Yes, I kick like a girl, and I swim like a girl, and I walk like a girl, and I wake up in the morning like a girl, because I am a girl. And that's not something that I should be ashamed of. So I'm gonna do it anyway. 
That's what they should do. If I asked you to, to run like a girl now, would you do it differently? I would run like myself. Would you like a chance to redo it? Why can't run like a girl also mean win the race? Do you want to take about 30 seconds to discuss it? We really don't have much time at all, but is that all? Just shout at me. Has anybody got any ideas? What would you do with that video? What could you do? Pardon? Let's talk about stereotypes. Yep, discuss, you know, women and girls and real abilities. Pardon? Encourage young girls. Okay, but imagine I got a whole class of mixed boys, girls, about 35 of them. What could we do? Pardon? Yeah, teach them to be comfortable with who they are. I'll tell you though, what, just for time reasons, I've done this with classes. We have done um, man up. You know, write another video for the phrase man up. Yeah, the run like a girl thing is sort of counteracted by man up. If you're not a macho, then ooh, you're not a man. You know, so flip it, taking that language and saying, what does it mean to be a man? Make another video for boys or for men. Um, there's a, obviously, it's an advert for a sanitary towel. So we've had the menstruation discussion. You know, why is it taboo? Um, just take it the way the students want to go with it. I'm just going to finish with one thing, though, that my students generally like doing, and it's design the T-shirt that goes with the campaign. I actually own this T-shirt the real one. I have it at home. Uh, I'm not sure if any of my former trainees have seen me wearing it. You might have done. Um, I have it, and I take it into the lesson, and I fold the bottom half up. So it's like a continue the sentence thing, and we discuss what they think the rest of the sentence is. Because it says, I run like a girl, do do do, and then something else. What do you think the bottom says? Because I am a girl... Because I do it better than you. Because <laughs> I win. Well, and I win. I'll show you. And then you can buy the t-shirt online somewhere. It says that. All right, so we designed the t-shirts. So just to finish, Basically, my message to you is don't be scared, don't be shy, bring all this stuff into the classroom, don't force the debates. I do not recommend you force debates with a bunch of secondary school kids, particularly if it's the beginning of the year. As the year progresses, you get to know them better. But you can certainly bring it all into the room and just see what happens. And you can either have a great vocabulary memory game, or you can have a whole discussion about gender stereotypes, racial stereotypes um, for professions. Run like a girl, you can write a video and you can write a story, or you can have a big discussion about what man up means and what toxic masculinity is and what what run like a girl means. Go with your students. Teach to your students. Remember things about the brain, about how the eyes work, and enjoy it. There's my email at the bottom. Flickr ERT pics is where I got some of the images uh, along the way, the one with the four girls, for example. My capella is my blog, which has been dormant but will be waking up very soon, and my Twitter. And now, it is time surprises <laughs> oh and if you've got any questions come on ask me afterwards <laughs> sorry about that i'll sit in the front of the stage at the end and if you've got any questions just come and have a chat